So let's get started. Any questions or comments before we get going? Anybody? All good? Okay. Uh, so I want to review what we talked about last time on Tuesday, and that is, um, or that was, depth of field, and that is depth of field. Uh, so we said that depth of field is the area in the image from the foreground to the background that is in focus, and um, there are three things that affect depth of field, or that we use to control depth of field, I should say. The first and foremost for us as photographers being the size of the aperture, which of course is located in the lens. So we said that the larger the aperture, the, that is the physical diameter of the aperture, and that is the smaller the f-stop number, the shallower the depth of field, which means the less will be in focus, and uh, the smaller the aperture, the smaller the aperture, uh, which is the larger, and that would be the larger the f-stop number, the greater the depth of field, and that is more, will be in focus from the foreground to the background. So let me just uh, bring up those notes, and we'll take a look at those again. So again, I want to remind you to do the readings. Um, there aren't that many, so but do the readings in the modules. Um, so there is a reading on depth of field and then my class notes as well. So I will just bring those up. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Can you guys see the um, can you see the module here that I brought up on Canvas? Depth of field? Anybody? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah. So again, depth of field, the area in the image that is in focus, specifically the area in front of and behind the point of focus that is uh, that is in focus. And we said that the ratio of that space, it can be a tiny bit of space or a, a great amount of space, the ratio of that space is 1 to 2, meaning that of the total amount of space that's in focus, so let's say focus on my nose, um, one-third of that space will be in front of my nose and two-thirds behind. And that can be a matter of inches or feet or, or tens of feet. Um, but that ratio generally remains the same. So, again, what depth of field is, and then the three things that affect depth of field. We said that aperture is the thing that we, use, we as photographers use to, to purposely change the depth of field. So when we want most or all of the frame to be in focus from the foreground to the background, we'll use a small aperture. And when we want uh, less to be in focus, or very little, then we will use a large aperture, which produces shallow depth of field. So, again, great depth of field is when most or all of the frame from the foreground to the background is in focus, and shallow depth of field is when very little of the frame, aside from the point of focus, is in focus. <laughs> so this was to explain why aperture uh, controlled the depth of field. And then uh, the second thing that affects depth of field is the focal length of the lens, how long the lens is or how short it is. And the shorter the lens is, or the, the more wide angle, or the wider the angle of view, the greater the depth of field. And the longer or more telephoto lens, the lens, excuse me, um, the shallower the depth of field will be. And we also went into why that is. But what you really need to know, of course, is that these things are true. You don't have to know the whys, but they are there, as we went over last time, if, if you're interested. Um, and the third thing, finally, 
is the distance from the point of focus or from your subject. And the further you are away from, from the subject or point of focus, the greater the depth of field will be. And the closer you are as you come in, the shallower the depth of field. And we then looked at examples of um, depth of field. And I just want to finish up on that. So uh, let, me, let me just get to that. Uh, but any questions on, on depth of field? Well, I'm, I am bringing up PowerPoint. No? OK. And uh, the second assignment is depth of field assignment. And um, so we went over that, and then I'll go over it again briefly. Um, boy, this thing is slow. I'm sorry. Very slow. I don't know what the problem is. Verifying Microsoft PowerPoint. I've been using it for some time, but uh, like years. Goodness. Okay, well maybe that is actually finished. So let's see here. Okay, so, <clears throat> sorry for this to, to have taken so long. This is uh, where we left off last time. This image of um, a starlet arriving at uh, a movie premiere in Hollywood um, made by the Swiss photographer Robert Frank. Um, and we talked about his work a little bit and said that... Uh, um, his work was not that well received when when it was made and published in the late 1950s but has since become a kind of classic uh the the road trip the photographed road trip across in this case across the united states and uh his work is kind of the precursor to grunge photography for lack of a better term um work that is considered by or was certainly considered by by other photographers to be messy, sloppy. The uh, the composition considered to be irregular and not well thought out. Uh, though I think that was not not necessarily true. I think that uh, it was purposely uh, photographed that way. But at any rate, um, it doesn't look very unusual uh, by today's standards because that's kind of become very acceptable to to have horizons not be horizontal to shoot uh, from the hip without actually looking through the viewfinder and focusing um, so that said this image with respect to depth of field um, shows us 
the the dominant area of the frame, this this uh, star, out of focus, and that is a little bit jarring because we expect to see the area that takes up the majority of the frame, especially if it's in the foreground, to be in focus. Um, so we don't like to look at things that are out of focus, and so our eyes are directed back in the frame to the area or areas that are in focus, the people who are watching this star arrive. Okay. This image shows extremely shallow depth of field. And if you were here uh, for the lecture on Tuesday, uh, if you think back to those images we looked at, uh, one of them was of an ear on a beach, uh, a rocky beach with, with cliffs and clouds in the background. And the photographer who made that image, Bill Brandt, made this image as well. And this image is essentially the opposite of that image. That image had almost infinite depth of field. Everything from the extreme foreground all the way back to infinity was in focus. In this image, the depth of field is so shallow that by the time you get back in the frame, maybe a foot or so, it's already falling out of focus. So we're looking at um, knees, so the tops of, of a woman's knees and the tops of her legs. Um, and you can see that the, the uh, lens is so sharp that we can make out the individual hairs on, on the legs. Um, but the, the depth of field is so shallow that we don't really know where she is or what's going on. And the image takes on a, a sort of graphic feel, you know, becomes more of a study of form and, and areas of light and dark. Uh, having seen that image last time, we can imagine that maybe she is on the same beach with the rocky you know, the rocky beach, and maybe there's water and horizon out beyond. But we don't know that. It could be some rocks in a garden, and and this could be a wall that's painted, or it could be an area of grass, or we, we don't really know. Um, so the, the effect is very different, of having this incredibly shallow depth of field. Um, and while we can make, perhaps make some assumptions about it, we don't really know, and we're not really supposed to know. This image shows uh, extremely, in some ways, extremely great depth of field, um, but it kind of fools us in terms of the, the um, the, uh, shoot, the word completely went out of my head. <laughs> Um, how, you know, the relationships here in terms of size, uh, scale, that's the word I wanted. This image was made by a Hungarian photographer named Andrei Kertes, and it was made from his window, a uh, view from his apartment window in New York City in uh, 1972, I think, just after the World Trade Towers were built. And it shows these these birds that appear to be enormous because they appear to be in the same plane essentially as the world trade towers almost like pterodactyls flying around which we know of course they're not but uh the scale is really kind of weird and that's because Kertes, the photographer used a really really long lens and one of the effects of using a very long lens, a telephoto lens, is what's called the compression of space. So it's difficult often to tell really how much space there is between the foreground and the background. And so that's what's happened here. These seagulls uh, that were flying around are actually, obviously, much closer to the photographer's lens than the trade towers are. The trade towers were probably a couple of miles away. Um, but but uh, Cartesia's lens 
caught these birds, either accidentally or probably purposely, in the frame as well. And because of this very long lens, the, sp the space between where the birds are and where the buildings are appears to be to have essentially disappeared. So they appear to be almost in the same plane as if these enormous birds are circling around these towers. Now, and obviously that's not so because each tiny little dot or little little rectangle in the the buildings is a window and they were big huge windows. So obviously if the birds were actually really close to the buildings they would just be specks, if even. Um, but it does give this kind of almost surreal impression of, of scale and of the buildings. This image was made by an American photographer named uh, Joel Meyerwitz out in, on Cape Cod, and it was published in a book called Cape Light. And it's a very still sort of image with not much going on in a way, uh, but it it I think it uses depth of field in an interesting way. First of all, at first glance, it looks kind of as if shallow depth of field had been used. But if you look more carefully, you can see that the depth of field is actually pretty great everything from the extreme foreground and that is the 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 piece of glass or the window with with all the rain on it everything from that point all the way out beyond the deck outside is in focus and um we can see that this is a window or a door you know a window and a door uh, we, we are shown the frame around the glass, and that is purposeful. So that, that tells us where we are. We are inside, uh, and everything else is outside. The deck, the deck furniture, the maybe a little pier or something beyond that, and there could be water beyond that with a little boat. That's in my imagination anyway. So beyond the deck, we're not sure, but we can certainly see what's what's outside of the window. Had the photographer used shallow depth of field and just focused, well, had he focused on the deck, the the window in the foreground with the water would have fallen out of focus. And so it just would have given everything a kind of blurry, kind of dreamy look. Had he focused on the window using shallow depth of field, then we would have seen all the droplets on the window, but just had a vague impression of forms and colors beyond that because they would have been out of focus. So by showing us both the foreground and the background in focus, the wet window and the deck and the deck furniture outside, the photographer tells us where we are inside and also why we're inside because it's a wet, rainy day. It's obviously summer because the deck furniture is out there, there's a boat and so on, but we're stuck inside because, because of the rain. And that is implied by that window that's in focus. Okay. We'll skip this one. <clears throat> Excuse me. This image was made by the French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson and we uh, saw another of his images last time and that was the image of the women in India in Kashmir looking out over the valley to the mountains on the other side and that image used great depth of field to show us both the women in the foreground and what they were experiencing this image as you can see uses shallow depth of field uh, so shallow, in fact, that the person in the extreme foreground over here is out of focus. And only the point of focus, this, this man here, is in focus. So this man uh, was the existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, and he is photographed in Paris by Henri Cartier-Bresson um, in 1947. So many years before he won the Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize. 
And you can see that Cartier-Bresson has used shallow depth of field uh, to isolate the subject, to isolate Sartre, uh, both from the, the man in the foreground and also from all of this information in the background going, going back behind him. So we have this very strong line of, of the, the railing of the bridge, the, um, the lamps, the lamp posts, the building, and the, the extreme background. And had they all been in focus, they probably would have competed with the subject for dominance or prominence, anyway, in the frame. And maybe we would have had more trouble deciding, at least subconsciously, on where our eyes were really supposed to go. Uh, were they supposed to be directed to Sartre or along this very strong line of perspective going back in the frame. Uh, so the use of shallow depth of field kind of relieves us of that problem. It tells us where to look. Um, again, we don't like to look at things that are out of focus. So we are directed to this area that is in focus. This next image was also made by uh, Sartre, and it's of uh, Sartre, sorry, by uh, Cartier-Bresson, and it's of Sartre's uh, life partner, the the writer and feminist, a feminist writer, Simone de Beauvoir, made in the same year that the portrait of Sartre was made, and in structure it's similar, or you might say comparable. Uh, the subject is also placed in the lower left-hand portion, sorry, lower right-hand portion of the frame, looking out to the left. The, the, um, there's also the use of perspective going back in the frame. There's even a lamp post, uh, as with the last image. Um, in this case, the perspective is going from left to right instead of from right to left, but, uh, Either way, the depth of field again is shallow. And again, this is used to isolate the subject from other information that might compete in the in the with the subject in the frame. So in this case, we have, of course, the lamppost and the the line of the street going back in the frame, uh, which is broken up beautifully by this group of people, these three people probably approaching. Um, they're so out of focus that we have no idea who they are as individuals. Um, and because they're out of focus, our eyes don't necessarily linger on them, but their presence is really important in terms of the structure of the image. Um, they really act as an anchor, both from right to left and from foreground to background. Um, so, so we have this sort of balance in the frame of areas of light and dark. Had they not been there and we just had this empty street, our eyes would have been drawn to the street and kind of back and beyond the subject. You know, we would have visually bypassed the subject, um, but their presence there balances the frame. Okay. And one last, <laughs> one last example, uh, one last image by Cartier-Bresson. And again, you can see the, the black line around the frame indicating that these images are, not, are uncropped, that they are as the photographer saw them in the camera and printed as such. Um, this image uses great depth of field. So everything from the extreme foreground all the way to the background is in focus. This is a portrait of the French, um, another French, but a French photographer named Robert Doineau, who photographed primarily in and around Paris. Um, and his images were clever. He used humor. They were kind of like humorous one-liners. Uh, affectionate usually of Paris, but anyway, uh, 
Cartier-Bresson has placed him on a rooftop in Paris, and you can see the rooftops of Paris going out behind him. Um, he has this, this railing in the frame, and the railing is really important in terms of the structure of the, of the frame because it, it acts as a frame within a frame and, and isolates Duano somewhat from the background. So had it not been there, Duano obviously would still be in the foreground, but our eyes would be carried back beyond him to the rooftops of Paris. And Cartier-Bresson placed him there on purpose and used great depth of field on purpose to, to have Duano be as one sort of with Paris. However, he also used this railing to isolate Duano so that we do we are directed to look at him rather than just kind of going back in the frame across the rooftops of Paris. Okay, so I hope that uh, these examples help you to, to understand, to have a better sense of what depth of field is and how it's used photographically to direct the viewer's eyes into and around the frame. And photographers use it purposely to, you know, to manipulate us in a way, to give a certain impression or to convey a message. And that's what we as photographers do and will do as well. So that said, uh, any questions? Anybody? No, okay. Uh, let me go back here. So, can you see this assignment? It says assignment number two, depth of field. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can. Great. Uh, so, again, the uh, second assignment deals with depth of field, and I want you to read this, of course, the whole thing before you do it. Um, so the first part of the assignment, available under assignments in uh, or on Canvas, is a, is a brief discussion and description of depth of field. And then the assignment itself, read this before you begin the assignment. I want you to make three sets of images, uh, one for each thing that affects depth of field. So aperture, focal length of lens, and distance from the point of focus or subject. Within each set, you're going to make two images, one that shows great depth of field and one that shows shallow depth of field, using only that particular element in each set. So for the first set, you will use aperture to change the depth of field, um, keeping the focal length of the lens and distance from subject the same. So you'll find a situation where you have space going back in the frame. So not just like from me to my wall, you know, two feet behind, but with more space. Um, and in the first image, you will, you'll of course decide on a point of focus. So a subject, your, you know, your sibling or parent or plant or pet or whatever. Um, and for the first image, making great depth of, or showing great depth of field, you'll use a very small aperture. So for example, f22. Uh, I advise that you put the camera into the aperture priority mode so that when you change the size of the aperture, the camera will, all, will automatically figure out the equivalent exposures and set the proper shutter speed for you so you don't have to worry about that. Um, one thing you should think about is about is the uh, ISO rating. So if you're photographing inside where there's less light, you'll want to use a higher ISO rating. If you're photographing outside with a lot of sunlight, uh, you'd want to use a less sensitive rating, a lower number, because you have a lot of light. Um, Anyway, for the first image showing great depth of field, you'll use a small aperture, for example, f22. 
And then for the second image, showing shallow depth of field, you will stop down the app, uh, sorry, open up the aperture, sorry about that, to a large aperture, uh, which will show, give you shallow depth of field. I don't want you to change the focal length of the lens. I don't want you to change where you're standing, and I don't want you to change the point of focus. All of those things remain the same. So the images should be essentially identical except for the depth of field. So when you open up the aperture to, for example, f4, f2.8, f2, you should have very shallow depth of field, or you should achieve shallow depth of field. Um, and again, having the, the camera in the aperture priority mode uh, will allow you to be free to think about um, the depth of field without having to also adjust the shutter speed. Okay. So in terms of, of exposure, in terms of light and dark, they should be the same as well. In the second set, you'll change the focal length of the lens. That's the second thing that affects depth of field. And so in this case, I want you to find a different situation, decide on a point of focus, decide on a focal length of the lens, uh, sorry, decide on a distance from the subject, decide on an aperture, so for example f8 or f11, and then use the focal length of the lens to change the depth of field. So for great depth of field, you'll use the shorter portion of the lens, the wider angle portion of the lens, and then for shallow depth of field, you'll extend the lens out and use the longer, more telephoto portion of the lens. Um, in this case, your composition will change. So when you're further back, you'll have a lot more information in the frame. And uh, sorry, when you have the, the wide angle lens, you'll have more information in the frame. And as you extend the lens out, you'll have less and less information as you come in closer with the lens. Your light meter reading may change as you extend the lens out because less light enters the camera through the lens as you have a lot longer lens. Uh, and so if you're in the, again, in the aperture priority, then the camera will change the shutter speed for you. And that's desirable because you don't want the, the size of the aperture to change. You want to keep that as a constant. In the third set, you'll use uh, or change the distance from the subject or point of focus, keeping the aperture and the focal length of the lens unchanged. So you'll find a third situation and either set it up yourself or photograph what's there. And in this case, you'll decide on a focal length of the lens, maybe 50 millimeters or what have you. You'll decide on a specific f-stop or aperture, again maybe f8 or f11, and then you will physically change your distance from the subject. So to show great depth of field you'll be further back, and as with a short lens that gives you a wider angle of view, and as you come in closer it's as if you're using a telephoto lens, the amount of information in your frame uh, uh, you know, on either side of your subject gets smaller and smaller as you physically come in closer and closer. Okay, uh, so three sets of images, two images each for a total of six images, and in each set you'll show shallow depth of field and great depth of field um, and how those three things affect the depth of field. Do not use the flash, so make sure your flash is turned off and um, don't use the auto or the program modes. Please use the either the manual mode if you feel comfortable doing that, but you have to remember to change the shutter speed as you change the aperture, or use the aperture priority mode, uh, which I think is easiest, and then you don't have to worry about figuring out the equivalent exposures yourself. When you have done that, uh, as you did with the... Um, the uh, sorry, <laughs> the first assignment. Um, you want to create a folder, and please remember to put your name on the folder. Don't just label it assignment number two with no name, please. Um, 
and then create three different folders. So here, aperture, distance from subject, focal length of lens. And within each of those folders, you'll put the, the corresponding images and please entitle them so I know what's going on. So here I'm showing you the aperture images and one is entitled great for depth of field and the f f stop or the aperture setting that was used f22 and then shallow depth of field f5.6 and that will be great for the titles and then for distance you can do one foot and ten feet or whatever it is you use and focal length of lens say 18 millimeters and 80 millimeters or whatever okay when you have done that uh, please zip your folders and please use zip if possible because um, I don't have software to open up all the different kinds of compression files like RAR and there are some others as well uh, so please zip your folders it's very easy to do um, you just let's see here so if you um, if you left click on a folder uh, you get this this menu to come up and you want to uh, select compress and then whatever the name of that folder is and when you do that then uh, you can see this bar up here it says compressing images to images.zip and I you know it takes about five seconds on mine anyway who knows uh, and then you get a, a zip file which you uh, will submit to Canvas and then I can open it and have a folder with your with all of your images already in the folder already named and so on okay okay any questions anybody all good Okay, good. Uh, so, um, this assignment is due next week on Thursday, I think. Today is, what, the 16th? So, that's right, yeah. So, a, a week from today. Um, the, the submission thing is open till the end of the term, which is only about three weeks away. But... Uh, I hope that you get your images in sooner rather than later, but if you miss the deadline, it's still open. You can still submit your images. Okay. So that said, uh, let's see, it is 12 minutes after 1. Okay. I want to look at some of your images. So we'll combine that with a lecture, somewhat of a lecture on Lightroom so getting into Lightroom uh, again and I've already got Lightroom open can you guys see this that I've gone to Lightroom yeah we can great yes okay excellent so um, sorry uh, Okay, my brain just uh, went somewhere else for a second. Uh, so <laughs> Lightroom, I've opened it up. I've opened up my catalog. Um, and right now it's in the import. So let me just get out of that for a moment. So last time uh, in Lightroom, we looked at these images for bracketing uh, as an example for, for bracketing. Um, and that's why they're up. And I got rid of the side panel, so let me bring those back. Okay, so Lightroom, when we open it up, looks like this. And I'm in the library module, so there are uh, seven modules, and if you look on the upper right, Libra you can see them library develop map book slideshow print web and then an eighth one that is just a, a cloud icon um, and 
as I said, we'll spend the majority of our time in the library and develop modules. And the library is where we import images, what we import the images into, where we see them and where we organize them. And the develop module is where we work on them. So Lightroom is, is not just an application for working on images. Uh, it's also a database where we can organize our images and that's very very useful um, to to see you know to to bring in images that we know we want to work on and to have them organized as we want them organized so that's up to you if you do it by title or date or subject or some combination thereof uh, so when we import images into Lightroom uh, we can we can assign words to them as we did last week uh, or discussed last week and um, those words will be attached to those images and if you type in that word or a couple of words images that have those words attached to them will come up as a grouping automatically um, The library module has, uh, all the modules have, have panels on either side of the central area. The uh, central area is where you look at, the, at your images. Um, in the, sorry, in the, uh, in the library module, um, You have things that refer to bringing the images in and organizing them and so on. Uh, let me back here. So you can look at your images as a grouping and that's called the grid view. So if you look down here just below where those images actually are, there's a little icon of a grid and then a rectangle and then it says XY and then there are several images with three dots that's called the survey view and then people which is the O view and then there are ways of um, uh, of cataloging or ranking the images and we'll talk about those in a moment so in the grid view you can see all of the images within a certain grouping. So on the left, we see the navigator, and that's the win that will show the image that is selected. Um, and as you select different images, a different image will, will appear in the navigator. And below that, it says catalog. And the catalog is that, that grouping or that file essentially that we made uh, and where all of our images will reside and um, this is a list so it doesn't actually move every time you make another list either a catalog or a folder or a collection it doesn't necessarily move the images and copy them so that it uses a lot of memory on your hard drive these are just lists that are made uh, for organization and when you click on them then those images show up so they're really um, rules that have been written algorithms that uh, that show us things but don't actually move things from place to place and so on um, and the same is true of when we work on images in Lightroom and that's one of I think the the great advantages of Lightroom over um, over Photoshop for example so when you work on images in Photoshop every time you do something you actually change the information in that file and if you like what you did you'll save a version of it so that you don't destroy the original one or you've worked on a copy and as you make different versions and save them you take up more and more space on your hard drive because you have to save a different version each time. Lightroom is non-destructive. It doesn't actually work, it doesn't actually change the information in the original image. 
it's as if you put a piece of clear acetate or plastic over the image and everything you do is like a sketch and then Lightroom saves that information that sketch and every time you open it up that sketch is, is placed over it again and you can save different versions but what you're saving are those different instructions that are placed over you know it essentially placed over the image so you don't have to save different versions of each uh, image in terms of a different file and take up a lot of space these are just instructions that are that are saved another really nice thing about Lightroom and we'll look at this more when we work in the develop module next time uh, is that the history of what you have done remains so for those of you who have worked in Photoshop you know that every time you close you quit out of Photoshop the history of what you've just done and maybe you've worked for five minutes or five hours the history of all of the, those steps disappears never to return um, and in Lightroom the history remains and you can undo things or or work over things and and still that history remains unless you actively get rid of it so I think that's a wonderful thing to have and you can always go back in the history and look at different area you know different things you've done if you like it you can make a snapshot of it and then move on and do more work or save a version of that as again as as instructions so it's a very very useful uh, application Photoshop is an incredibly powerful application and you can do so many things with it that you cannot do in Lightroom but Lightroom for basic manipulations of images changing things in terms of exposure and, and so on it's so much easier in Lightroom than it is in Photoshop so I, I really recommend Lightroom because for basic image uh, manipulations for the things that many of us want to do the, the, they're available in Lightroom and uh, much more straightforward than they are in Photoshop as well so anyway we talked about how to import images or we briefly talked about importing images into Lightroom and so to do so we click the import button uh, and when we do that on the on the left hand side it says select a source so that's where we select the images that we want to import um, and let's see here those are not the ones I want um, so what initially appears are whatever sources I have so my Macintosh hard drive and then this is my external hard drive and that's actually where um, where I think I saved the images but anyway uh, right now I'll go here and select a source so I have these sources here I can come up here and this allows me to select areas on the hard drive so I will select other source and I know that these are on my desktop so I'm going to select these images or these folders and it'll probably take a little while but these are the ones I want to import these are your assignment and um, then I have to decide which ones I'm going to import they they sorry the default is to have them all checked to have everything that I've selected imported but they show them as the individual files so if there are some I don't want to import I can uncheck them if I know that there are only a few that I do want to import I can uncheck them all and then just check the couple that I want to import and then over uh, to the to the right 
um, I have these choices as to where the images are going to go. And so I said that I wanted you guys to make a folder for Lightroom. So my folder resides uh, in my De Anza folder under Photo 4 um, for summer of 2020. And I made a folder for Lightroom. Can you guys all see that? Great. And within that folder, I made two separate folder folders one for images, one for the Lightroom catalog. So the Lightroom catalog is over here. And the images folder is where I want the images that I have, that, uh, that I import into Lightroom. That's where I want them to live. So in Lightroom, under uh, that would be destination, that's the last choice here. I have to tell Lightroom that's where I want them to go. So I also have to go down here to my external hard drive and happily it's already open to that because it because that's where I imported images the last time. So under classes photo for summer 2020 in the Lightroom folder into the images folder I then will import these images of yours. If I want them to go into a subfolder, I can go up here and check where check into subfolder and maybe I want this to say um what I want it to say. Uh maybe just assignment. Sorry, not uh, number one. Okay. And so now those images will go into a folder that says assignment number one, as you can see down here. And then I decide how I want them organized. Do I want them organized by original folder, by date, or into one folder? I want them organized by original folder so that I can see your names and know whose images are whose but you may not want that. Maybe you want them all organized by date and then you have all these choices <laughs> for how, to, how you want the date. Uh, so that's up to you. Uh, I like to have the year first and then the date but it really doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway for this for this import I want original folders so that's what I'll choose. And uh, then usually I do this first but up at the top it says file handling and uh, build previews I want at least standard not minimal um, then build smart pre previews you want to check this because um, then Lightroom builds these previews of your um, of your images and even if you don't have the um, your hard drive, if you have the images on an external hard drive, uh, even if you don't have that hard drive plugged in, then you can still work on the images with the previews and that information will be saved. Excuse me one moment. Sorry, I forgot to plug my computer in and it was running out of power. So um, you want to build pr uh, smart previews don't import suspected duplicates so uh, that's good because then you don't if you've forgotten you've imported images into Lightroom then you're not importing them over and over again uh, so if you've already imported some images then those will be grayed out and you can see uh, that that they are no longer you know that they're not that they're not actually being imported. Now you can uncheck that if you want to import everything if you're not sure. Make a second copy. <coughs> that is if you um, if you are importing for example directly from a memory card uh, your camera's memory card um, or you know a, a, a flash drive um, and you want the images to go both into Lightroom and then and then also 
uh, to a more permanent residence, um, you can do that at the same time. So it saves time if you need to do that. And then it says add to collection. So if in the future you make collections uh, within the catalog for different um, images, you can, if they, if all of these images fit that description, you can just click add to collection and then you don't have to do that after the fact. Um, and I said renaming, sorry, that's up to you. I don't generally rename my my files, at least not initially. Um, also because I tend to import a lot of files at once, so going through and naming every single one gets a little nuts. Um, apply during import. Uh, develop settings I set to none because that's why I mean, I use Lightroom in order to manipulate the images as I, as I want to. And so I don't necessarily want every single image uh, imported and then worked on by, by using one of these presets, like high contrast or something like that. Uh, the metadata, we said, is uh, information that's embedded into the folder or the file for each image. And you can put your own information in there. Um, I think that's a good idea. Your images belong to you, no matter what. They are, they are automatically copyrighted to you. But it's sometimes nice to state that. And so uh, here's what I have. I just put very basic information in. Um, the copy name, if I've named the image and so on, and ratings, I don't have any yet because I haven't imported them. Um, what I put in is what's called the IPTC copyright, so my name, the copyright status, which is copyrighted to me, and then um, rights, rights usage terms, I, huh, some of the information disappeared. Not to be reproduced without permission of the artist. Uh, or photo Oh, it's photographer there. That's fine. It just didn't continue. So it shows the last word there. All right. Um, copyright info URL. So if you have, um, if you have a, a website you want to list there, you can put that there. Then the IPTC creator, your name under creator. Oops. Uh, I don't put my address and phone number in. That's up to you uh, what you want to put in. I put my email and uh, I took the website out for whatever reason. But you can put your website in if you have a job title, you know, like professor or, or you know, editor of whatever. You can put that in. Date created. The thing is, all of this information, the date and so on, a lot of that is already included if you have the GPS turned on in your camera. So that's up to you. Um, what I, again, what I put in is my basic information and the fact that the image is copyrighted. Okay. So done. Yes, I'll save those. And then uh, every image that is imported will have that metadata embedded into it. So it will, it will say that it, I took it and that it is copyrighted and so on. In addition to the information that's already there, uh, information about the specific image, the camera that was used, the lens, the settings, and so on. So that's apply during import, and then we set the destination, and then we click on import. And then um, a progress bar appears on the upper left-hand corner. And it's, it will always say non-raw files were not converted to DNG. That's fine. DNG is digital negative. And you click OK. And then it builds smart previews. And it, again, I will say smart previews were built or already exist for 22 photos. Don't worry about the already exist. It just says that in case you had imported them at an earlier time. And then it finishes up with the, with the loading and building previews. And now 
those images appear in the library. So if we go back to the left hand panel uh, where it says catalog, I now have 111 images in, in Photoshop, sorry, in Lightroom. And then in the previous import, that actually shows this last import. Um, they maybe should say latest import or current import, but that's what previous import shows. And then below that, it says folders. So the first one is catalog, and then it says folders. <clears throat> and that shows where these images reside uh, so that you know. Below that, it says collections. And so collections is where you can make lists of your images according to, or groupings, according to whatever, however you want to group them. So uh, let's say in my, here's my catalog where I have a, a whole bunch of different things just kind of crammed in. Um, so let's say I want to make um, a grouping, a cattle, uh, sorry, a collection of these images that have spider webs. And they're not all in order. You know, they're not all together in one group. So, and maybe I don't want all of them, but let me select the ones I do want. And so in order to